The Battle of Brody was a tank battle fought between the 1st Panzer Group's 3 Army Corps and 48 Army Corps and 5 Mechanized Corps of the Soviet 5th Army and 6th Army in the triangle formed by the towns of Dubno, Lusk and Brody between 23 and 30 June 1941. It is known in Soviet historiography as one of the border defensive battles. Although the Red Army formations inflicted heavy losses on the German forces, they were outmaneuvered and suffered enormous losses in tanks. Poor Soviet logistics, German air supremacy and a total breakdown in Red Army command and control ensured victory for the Wehrmacht, despite overwhelming Red Army numerical and technological superiority. It was one of the most intense armored engagements in the opening phase of Operation Barbarossa, and some say that it may surpass the more famous Battle of Proorivka. Chapter 1, Prelude 1st Panzer Group, led by General Oberst Paul Ludwig Ewald von Kleist, was ordered to secure the Bug River crossings and advance to Ravno and Korostin with the strategic objective of Kiev. It deployed two corps forward and advanced between Lviv and Ravno in an attempt to cut the Lviv-Kiev railway line, thus driving a wedge along junction point between the Soviet 5th and 6th armies. The southwestern front, under the command of General Mikhail Kirponos, had received incomplete intelligence on the size and direction of the German attack. They were surprised when Stavka ordered a general counterattack under the title of Directive No. 3 on the authority of Chief of General Staff Georgi Zukov. Most of the headquarters staff were convinced that the strategy would be to remain in a defensive posture until the situation clarified. Later Havalis Bagramayan, a staff officer of the front headquarters who wrote the initial report to Moscow, said that our first combat report to Moscow, was full of generalities and unclear instructions. The general orders of Directive No. 3 read. While maintaining strong defense of the state border with Hungary, the 5th and 6th armies are to carry out concentric strikes in the direction of Lublin, utilizing at least five mechanized corps and aviation of the front, in order to encircle and destroy the enemy group of forces advancing along the vladimir volensky kristinopol front, and by the end of June 24 to capture the vicinity of Lublin. By the end of the 22nd of June, Zukov was on his way to the southwestern front headquarters at Ternopil along with Nikita Khrushchev, the former head of the organizational department of the Ukrainian Communist Party's Central Committee, to ensure these orders were carried out. Chapter 2 Disposition of Forces Six Soviet mechanized corps, with over 2,500 tanks, were massed to take part in a concentric counterattack through the flanks of Panzer Group 1. The intention was to later attempt to pincer movement from the north and south that met west of Dubno in order to trap units of the 6th and 17th German armies on the northern flank of Army Group South. To achieve this, the 8th Mechanized Corps was transferred from the command of the 26th Army, positioned to the south of the 6th Army, and placed under the command of N.I. Musychenko's 6th Army. This essentially brought all the mobile assets of the southwestern front to bear against the base of von Kleist's thrust toward Kiev. The primary German infantry formation operating on this sector of the front, 4 Army Corps of the 17th Army were advancing southeast with the objective of cutting the Lviv-Kiev railway line. Chapter 2 Section 1, German Armour At the beginning of Operation Barbarossa, German armour was composed of a mix of Czech and German tanks, as well as small numbers of captured French and British tanks. Furthermore, nearly 50% of the tanks deployed by the Wehrmacht were the Panzer I and Panzer II light tanks. Of the 4,000 armored vehicles available to the Wehrmacht only 1,400 were the new Panzer III and Panzer IV. In the first few hours of the invasion, German commanders were shocked to find that some Soviet tanks were immune to all anti-tank weapons in use by the Wehrmacht. During pre-war exercises, Heinz Guderian noted that on their own, tanks were vulnerable to infantry. Furthermore, he also noted that tanks lacked the heavy caliber weapons needed to knock out reinforced concrete bunkers and heavily fortified positions, a role that could only be performed by heavy artillery or air strikes. While dispersing tanks among infantry formations solved many of the tanks' weaknesses, it also negated some of their strengths. Therefore, 
German military theorists concluded that to reach their full potential, armored units needed to be concentrated in their own formations and integrated with mobile artillery, mobile infantry, and close air support. Lastly, Guderian concluded that in order for tanks to be at their peak effectiveness, all armored vehicles must be equipped with radios so that each tank commander could hear instructions from the unit commander allowing each tank to work with all others in an organized fashion. Chapter 2 Section 2 – Soviet Armor At the beginning of June, the Red Army included over 19,000 tanks in their inventory, most of them light tanks such as the T-26 or BT-7. The front armor of the T-26 was just 15 mm thick, and the BT-7, just 22 mm, offering virtually no protection against any anti-tank weapon at any range. Furthermore, the poor design of Soviet shells meant that most rounds shattered on contact, rather than penetrating. More modern tanks, such as the KV-1 and the T-34, were only beginning to roll off production lines and were not available in anywhere near the numbers that were needed to throw back the German advance. During the interwar years, far-sighted military theorists such as Mikhail Tukhachevsky came to similar conclusions as Heinz Guderian regarding tanks in modern warfare. However, during the Great Purge Tukhachevsky was executed. Red Army tanks were dispersed widely throughout infantry divisions in the 1930s. Then came the shock of the fall of France. Surviving armored warfare theorists such as Konstantin Rokossovsky were quickly and quietly reinstated in their positions and began assembling tanks into concentrated formations with all possible speed. However, by June 1941 this process was barely half complete, so many of the 19,000 tanks in the Red Army arsenal, were still dispersed among infantry divisions on the eve of the invasion. This ensured that even if the Red Army had a unified command, many of its armored units would be committed piecemeal. Chapter 2 Section 3 – German Logistics At full strength, a German panzer division was a balanced formation with between 150 and 200 tanks, motorized infantry, motorized artillery, and motorized engineers. To support its logistical needs, each panzer division included 2,000 trucks. Furthermore, each panzer division had its own integral artillery and infantry support, which meant that rather than providing a supporting role for infantry, German panzers performed a leading role, with infantry providing support. Furthermore, Wehrmacht doctrine stressed the importance of training soldiers in roles performed by other men. Tank crews were trained in artillery roles, infantry trained as tank crews, etc. Most importantly, tank crews were also trained as mechanics, giving them the knowledge to fix broken equipment in the field. Chapter 2 Section 4 – Soviet Logistics In the immediate pre-war period, few preparations were made, and the Red Army was at a low level of readiness. Units were not concentrated, ammunition and other supply dumps were neither concealed nor quickly available to combat units. Compounding the problem was that Stalin strictly forbade any Red Army unit from opening fire on reconnaissance patrols, allowing the Germans to easily identify all major targets in the border districts. Furthermore, Soviet tank crews were not trained on the mechanical details of their machines. That meant that simple mechanical problems resulted in hundreds of Red Army tanks being abandoned on the roadside en route to the battle. Those units that did manage to show up at their jumping-off points then discovered that the supplies had either been destroyed or moved to another location without updating their locations. After receiving orders to attack and lacking fuel or ammunition, the crews responded by destroying their vehicles and retreating. Hundreds of tanks were lost in this way. Compounding these logistical difficulties was that each Red Army tank division had 300 to 400 tanks, but were supported by only 1,500 trucks, contrasting with a Wehrmacht tank division which had only 150 to 200 tanks, but 2,000 trucks. Experience would prove that the ratio of trucks to tanks favored by the Germans was far more effective. Chapter 3 Balance of the Tank Forces On the 22nd of June 1941, 
the balance of tanks over the entire area of the German Army Group South and the Soviet Southwestern Front, including but not limited to the main Battle of Brody, was as follows. The figures presented above for Russian formations are on hand totals for those units and do not reflect actual operational vehicle numbers. Even these apparently impressive on hand numbers are not close to the unit's authorized strengths because those organizations were still in the process of being formed and equipped at the time of the invasion. The 15th, 19th, and 22nd Mechanized Corps were only created a few months prior to the start of the war, leaving these formations unprepared, uncoordinated, ill or untrained, and not ready for effective combat operations. Even the 4th, 8th, and 9th Mechanized Corps had been in existence less than a year at the start of the war. Soviet ill-preparedness, lack of training, and lack of fuel, ammunition, and spare parts assured that actual, operational vehicles were dramatically less in number. Even those that were operational were often not bore-sighted and therefore could not fire accurately, whether ammunition was available or not. German armored formations had seen two successful campaigns and three years of war prior to the attack on Russia, and, while some reduction in unit cohesion and effectiveness was caused by the doubling of the number of panzer divisions prior to Operation Barbarossa, this disruption was relatively minor. German armored units with effective command, control, communication, and plentiful supply, coupled with considerable prior combat experience and extensive training, were more combat effective than their opponents. Chapter 4, Battle in the Air The condition of the Soviet Air Force assigned to the Southwestern Front followed the pattern of the entire front line, the majority of its aircraft had been destroyed on the ground as a result of Stalin, disregarding intelligence that a German attack was imminent, refusing to put Soviet forces on alert. For example, Lieutenant Archipenko's 17th Fighter Regiment were caught on the ground and almost totally destroyed by the third day of the war. The remainder of the regiment, comprising only 10 I-153s and one MiG-1, retreated to a reserve airfield near Ravno. Still, the Soviets sent their surviving aircraft to support the offensive. The Luftwaffe prevented Soviet aerial reconnaissance leaving Soviet commanders blind to a rapidly developing and fast-moving battle. The air battle resulted in heavy casualties for the attacking Soviets. JG-3, under the command of Flieger Corps 4, shot down 24 Tupolev S.B.'s. On the first day. Among the casualties was the commander of 86 BAP, Lt. Col. Sorokin. Just 20 of the initial 251 S.B.'s remained with the unit. German losses were also heavy, with 28 destroyed and 23 damaged aircraft. The efforts of the Red Army Air Force were not without effect, as the Southwestern Front Air Force flew 523 sorties between 22 June and 24 June, dropping 2,500 bombs. Gustav Schrodk, a tank commander of the 15th Panzer Regiment, recorded the scene, at dawn of June 24, the regiment underwent its first attack by Russian bombers. It shall not be the only one this day, completely the opposite. As a result of this the regiment now has several dead and wounded. Near total Luftwaffe air superiority was to be a major factor in breaking up the Soviet counterattack. Chapter 5 Mobilization. The attack combined 6 Mechanized Corps under the command 5th Army to the north and the 6th Army to the south, under the general direction of Southwestern Front Commander Kirponos. Under the 5th Army command, Konstantin Rokosovsky's 9th and N.V. Fiklenko's 19th Mechanized Corps were to be deployed northwest of Ravno, while the 22nd Mechanized Corps was to assemble northeast of Lusk. To the south, under the command of the 6th Army, Dmitry Rybyshev's 8th and Ikarpizo's 15th Mechanized Corps were to be deployed to the southwest and northeast of Brody, while the 4th Mechanized Corps under A. Vlosov was to be deployed between Sokol and Radikiv, on the left flank of the 15th Mechanized Corps. The plan called for these forces to assemble and begin offensive operations at 2200 hours on 23rd of June, 36 hours after the initial German onslaught, in an attempt to catch the attackers off guard, 
and before they could solidify their position by bringing up reinforcements from the rear in support of their fast advancing 11th Panzer Division. Conditions were difficult for the Soviet Corps commanders, loss of communications, constant harassment by the Luftwaffe, lack of transportation, and the movement of large numbers of refugees and retreating soldiers on the roads made it difficult for the counter-attacking forces to assemble at their jumping-off points. While communication between the front headquarters and the individual army commands was generally good, communication to the front-line units was seriously flawed, because it was dependent on the civilian telephone and telegraph network. German sappers, air attacks, and Ukrainian nationalist guerrillas had aggressively targeted these systems. Many Soviet frontline commanders were left to their own devices, and this disrupted the effectiveness of Soviet command and control. In one instance, the commander to the 41st Tank Division of the 22nd Mechanized Corps, for want of any new directives, moved his division to the designated assembly point for his corps at Cavell laid out in the pre-war plan, and in so doing, moved his division away from the fighting. Another endemic problem was the lack of transport for the infantry component of the mechanized corps. Motorized in name only, many of these divisions had only part of their full transportation establishment. Individual corps commanders had to improvise solutions to bring their full complement of soldiers to their assembly points. Rokosovsky commandeered 200 trucks from the district reserve at Shepetivka, but this still left him in the position of mounting much of his infantry on tanks. Even then, many soldiers had to walk, since the trucks were carrying critical munitions and supplies. In one case, heavy artillery pieces belonging to the 22nd Mechanized Corps were simply left behind for want of tractors to pull them. The commander of the 19th Mechanized marched his corps forward in two echelons with the tank divisions far in advance of his lagging infantry, which meant that his armored units arrived at the battlefield without infantry support. Ryabyshev, commander of the 8th Mechanized, reported similar problems. His artillery was towed by exceedingly slow tractors that held up the movement of the entire column, the columns were moving at top speed. Unfortunately, the tractor-towed corps artillery was falling severely behind, the difference in speed was slowing down the overall concentration of forces. These complications were compounded by the apparent inability of the Soviet commanders to assess an appropriate axis of attack in the context of the rapidly developing German salient. Between 22 June and 24 June, the 8th Mechanized Corps received three different locations for its assembly point, the original order from the front command, a new one from the commander of the 6th Army, and on 24 June another order from the front command. The Corps crossed its own path and backtracked several times before finally arriving at Brody. Ryabyshev later wrote. Around the second half of June 25, the Corps units deployed to the northwest of Brody. During the nearly 500-kilometer march, the Corps lost up to half of its older tanks and a substantial portion of its artillery and anti-tank guns to both enemy air attack and mechanical breakdowns. All of the tanks still in service also required varying degrees of maintenance work and were not capable of operating over long distances. Thus, even before the start of the counteroffensive the Corps found itself in a drastically weakened state. As a result of these and other problems assembling the forces for the attack, the scheduled time for the operation was set back six hours to four o'clock on the 24th of June. By the time this decision was made on the evening the 23rd of June, barely 48 hours since the war had begun, the 11th Panzer Division, with the 16th Panzer Division traveling in its wake, had already penetrated 40 miles into Soviet territory. The 13th and 14th Panzer Divisions were well their way up the road to Lusk with the objective of reaching the Steer River on the 24th, and the 44th, 298th, and 299th Infantry Divisions were moving up to consolidate the advance. Even with the delayed schedule, the counterattack began piecemeal, since the full complement of forces could not be brought into position until two days later. The 4th, 8th, 9th, and 19th Mechanized Corps were still on the march and supporting infantry corps were even further away. Kerponos's chief of staff, General Maxim Perkayev, 
argued against the political officer attached to the Southwest Front, Commissar Nikolai Vazhugin, on this point but Vazhugin and Zhukov won out, the attack would begin without delay. Only two tank divisions of 15th Mechanized Corps in the south and a single tank division of 22nd Mechanized Corps in the north were in position to begin the attack on the 24th. Chapter 6, Soviet Counterattacks Three Soviet formations deployed a potent force of modern T-34 and KV tanks, the 4th, 8th, and 15th Mechanized Corps. The 717 such tanks comprised almost a half of the country's 1,600 production of these two models. Throughout the battles, the scale of the intended operations and the precise role of each corps in the plan were communicated poorly or not at all. Ryabyshev noted that the corps battle orders spoke only to its own mission objectives. There was little to no communication between the individual corps to ensure coordination. Chapter 6, Section 1, 10th Tank Division The Soviet 10th Tank Division was subordinate to 15th Mechanized Corps. On the 22nd of June 1941, the forward battalions captured Radikiv from the German infantry, losing two tanks. The next day it faced the German 11th Panzer Division there, destroying 20 German tanks and losing 6 T-34 tanks and 20 BT tanks. It withdrew in an orderly fashion because of a lack of ammunition. On the 26th of June 1941, the division destroyed 23 German tanks and an infantry battalion near Radikiv, losing 13 KV and 12 BT-7 tanks. Chapter 6, Section 2, 15th Mechanized Corps Commanded by I.A. Karpizer. the 15th Mechanized Corps as a whole had 749 tanks, including 136 T-34 and KV tanks. Due to a series of inconsistent orders, the Corps spent the battle moving chaotically in the radikiv brody busk triangle. Except for the two engagements with the 10th Tank Division, its forces were not in combat. On 7 July 1941 it reported in Berzovka from the former border, with 9% of its tanks. Chapter 6 Section 3 22nd Mechanized Corps. Commanded by Major General S. M. Kondrus of DOT on 24 June the 22nd Mechanized Corps attacked towards Voinitsa. On 29 June it reported having only 19% of its former number of tanks. On 1 July one regiment unsuccessfully attacked toward Dubno. On 15 July 1941 the 22nd MC had 4% its tanks remaining. Major General Semyon Kondrusov was killed by a shell during fighting near the village of Alexandrovska in the Volyn region on June 24, 1941. Chapter 6, Section 4, 19th Mechanized Corps Commanded by Major General Nikolai Fiklenko. on 26 June it attacked towards Dubno from the north, but failed to reach it by a few kilometers. On 29 June the Corps had 32 tanks remaining out of the original 453. Chapter 6 Section 5, 8th Mechanized Corps Ryabyshev's 8th Mechanized Corps finally arrived on the scene on the 25th. On the 26th of June 1941, the 8th Mechanized Corps as a whole successfully attacked in the direction of Brody Berestekko against parts of the German 11th Panzer Division. Despite haphazard arrangements and difficulties, the Soviet attack met with some initial success, catching the Germans on the move and outside their prepared positions, their tanks sweeping aside hastily arranged German anti-tank positions manned by motorcycle troops attached to the 48th Panzer Corps. Later the 8th MC split, with some amalgamating into Popol's group and a second force remaining under the command of Ryabyshev. 12th Tank Division 56 KV and 100 T-34 tanks of this division ran out of fuel and ammunition while attacking near Dubno. Combat operations were forced to a standstill. Chapter 6, Section 5 Subsection 2 Popol's Group Popol's Group had about 300 tanks, including no less than 100 T-34 and KV tanks. On 27 June, 
Popol's group surprised and defeated the rear of 11th Panzer Division and captured Dubno, a road crossing of strategic importance. This was the most successful Soviet action of the battle, as it cut off supply lines of the German armored spearhead. However, this was not exploited by Soviet command, who failed to communicate with Popol and to provide supplies or reinforcements. The group waited in Dubno and prepared for defense, losing the operational initiative. The situation was considered serious by the German high command. In the Army Group South sector, heavy fighting continues on the right flank of Panzer Group 1. The Russian 8th Tank Corps has effected a deep penetration of our front and is now in the rear of the 11th Panzer Division. This penetration has seriously disrupted our rear areas between Brody and Dubno. The enemy is threatening Dubno from the southwest, the enemy also has several separate tank groups acting in the rear of Panzer Group 1, which are managing to cover considerable distances. By the 28th of June the Germans had gathered enormous forces. The Popol's group came under attack by elements of the 16th Motorized, 75th Infantry Division, two other infantry divisions, and the 16th Panzer Division. Encircled in Dubno, Popol defended until 1 July, when he retreated. Chapter 6, Section 5 Subsection 3 Ryabyshev's Group Ryabyshev's group had 303 tanks, including 49 T-34 and 46 KV. On 28 June, in an attempt to follow Popol, it met and attacked the German 57th Infantry and 75th Infantry Divisions, as well as elements of 16th Panzer Division. The attack was unsuccessful and the Soviets quickly retreated. On 1 July Ryabyshev reported in Tarnopol with 207 tanks, including 31 T-34 and 43 KV tanks. With no further combat, the 8th MC moved to Kozyatin, where on 7 July 1941 it had 43 tanks, 5% of the pre-war number. Chapter 6, Section 6, 4th Mechanized Corps The 4th Mechanized Corps commanded by Andrei Vlosov was the strongest in the Ukraine, having 313 T-34 and 101 KV among its total of 979 tanks. It reacted slowly to orders and failed to assemble for attack. The most it achieved was on 28 June, when it secured the retreat of 15th Mechanized Corps from the pushing German infantry. Whilst not attacking or being attacked, the Corps reported it retained no more than 6% of its KV tanks, 12% of its T-34 tanks, and 4% of its light tanks on 12 July. Besides these, there were no more notable Soviet counterattacks in this battle. 22 ND Mechanized Corps, 41st Tank Division. 31 of this unit's KV tanks, its most effective fighting element, blundered into swampy terrain and were lost. Chapter 7 Decision, Indecision, and Confusion of Command The Historical Debate. The effect of the hesitation and confusion of command on the 27th of June on the outcome of the battle and the German attack into Ukraine is hard to determine. When the Soviet forces took Dubno and cut off the leading edge of the main German attack, Kerponos thought that the same German attack threatened to outflank, and encircle the Soviet forces attacking from the south. This led him to order a halt to the offensive and a general retreat in order to rationalize his front line, so as to prevent the enemy tank groupings from penetrating into the rear of the 6th and 26th armies, according to H. Bagramayan. After a debate with the front commander and his staff, Georgi Zukov quickly had these orders countermanded, orders for a renewed attack were issued two hours later. This led to even more of the confusion that was symptomatic of the Soviet command at the Battle of Brody. Rokosovsky, who was in command of the 9th Mechanized Corps attacking from the north, simply balked at these new orders, stating that we had once again received an order to counter-attack. However, the enemy outnumbered us to such a degree, that I took on the personal responsibility of ordering a halt to the counter-offensive, and to meet the enemy in prepared defenses. Meanwhile, Ryabyshev commanding the 8th Mechanized Corps to the south, complied with the order and remounted the attack. Ryabyshev, seems to take the position held by Zukov at the time, 
which is that if the attack had continued aggressively and without delay, the Soviets might have been successful. However, subsequent events seem to vindicate Kirponos's position, which was that the attack was premature and would destabilize the integrity of the entire front. Shortly after the Soviet counterattack was routed, Marshal Semyon Budyani was given overall command of the combined southwestern and southern front. Disaster unfolded at the Battle of Uman and 100,000 Soviet soldiers were killed or captured and another 100,000 wounded when three Red Army formations, the 26th, the 12th and 18th Army were encircled after Army Group South renewed its attack by pivoting south from the positions it had achieved, during the Battle of Dubno, an outcome that Kirponos had foreshadowed in his arguments with Zhukov about the wisdom of the counterattack at Dubno. The confrontation between Kirponos and Zhukov led Zhukov to tell the Southwestern Front political officer, Nikita Khrushchev, I am afraid your commander here is pretty weak, a charge that Kirponos would never be able to answer, since he died in the Battle of Kiev after it was surrounded. Chapter 8, Summary The battle between Panzer Group, one and the Soviet mechanized corps was the fiercest of the whole invasion, lasting four full days. The Soviets fought furiously, and crews of German tank and anti-tank guns found to their horror that the new Soviet T-34 tanks were almost immune to their weapons. The new KV-1 and KV-2 heavy tanks were impervious to virtually all German anti-tank weapons, but the Red Army's logistics had completely broken down due to Luftwaffe attacks. The German Kampfschwader de Bomber wings, namely KG-51, KG-54, and KG-55, contributed a series of heavy low-level attacks against Soviet ground targets. The headquarters of the Soviet 15th Mechanized Corps was destroyed, and its commander, General Major Ignat Karpizo, was wounded. The Luftwaffe destroyed some 201 Soviet tanks in this area. The five Red Army Corps were mishandled while being concentrated into large powerful groups. The German troops sought to isolate individual units and destroy them. Meanwhile, the Luftwaffe ranging over the battlefields was able to separate the supporting infantry and deny them resupply of fuel and ammunition. Ultimately, due to lack of adequate planning and overall coordination, the Soviet counterattack failed to meet at Dubno. Chapter 9 After the Battle Panzer Group 1 took a severe battering in the battles around Dubno, losing many of its tanks, but it survived the battle still capable of operations. The Soviet forces took severe casualties, rendering most of its forces non operational. This defensive success enabled the Germans to continue their offensive, even if it had been delayed substantially by the tenacity of the Soviet counterattack. The 8th Mechanized Corps was so badly depleted that the Stavka disbanded its headquarters and parceled out its remaining assets to other formations of the Southwestern Front. Chapter 10 Sources Bergstrom, Krista. Barbarossa, The Air Battle, July to December 1941. London, Chevron slash Ian Allen. ISBN 978-18578-02702. Dykeman, Paul. Price, Alfred. Spearhead for Blitzkrieg, Luftwaffe Operations in Support of the Army 1939-1945. New York, Ivy Books. Kamenir, Victor. The Bloody Triangle, The Defeat of Soviet Armor in the Ukraine. June 1941. Minneapolis, Zenith Press. ISBN 978-0-7603-3434-8. Khrushchev, Nikita Sergeyevich. Talbot, Strobe. Khrushchev Remembers. 1. Andre Deutsch. Popol, Nikolai. Moscow, Izdvo ASD. ISBN 5170056265. Ryabi Chef, D.I. On the role of the 8th Mechanized Corps in the June 1941 counteroffensive mounted by the Southwestern Front. The Russian Battlefield. Retrieved 19 June 2013. Solonine, Mark. 
22 Chefts 1941 Chile Jack Cicella C. Wielka Wojna Ogzeizniana. Poznan, Poland, Dom Y. Dornix E. Rebees. ISBN 9788375101300.